Hello world, Satonic here. Let's jump right into today's hacking news roundup. First up, someone tweeted that they used a publicly disclosed vulnerability to take down 69% of the Dogecoin network from an old ThinkPad in rural El Salvador. And he wasn't making this up. According to Blockchair, the number of public Dogecoin nodes dropped from 647 to just 205. The network was seemingly under attack, but the price of Dogecoin was totally unaffected. So what was going on here? Well, last week, security researchers disclosed the Doge Reaper vulnerability, which allowed anyone to crash a node in the Dogecoin network with nothing more than an IP address and port. Just type your targets into the Doge Reaper tool, and a segmentation fault would cause the node to try and access memory that it wasn't allowed to, resulting in the target node crashing. The vulnerability was responsibly disclosed, a patch was released, and many nodes did update, but not all of them, leaving the door open for Andreas Cole to come along a week later and do some mischief. Whilst it's claimed that he took out 69% of public nodes, I should point out that this is according to Blockchair, which some people say underestimates the true number of public nodes. Other sources say there's well over 10,000 of them, in which case 69% would be a huge exaggeration. But there is apparently some indication that these guys are overestimating and including inactive nodes in their list. But regardless of whose numbers you trust, had this been widely exploited before nodes were able to update, there might have been more of an impact. With public nodes knocked offline on mass, transactions might have had trouble propagating throughout the network, and it's not like your Dogecoins would have just disappeared, but you might have had trouble spending and receiving them for a little while until patches were applied and nodes restarted. The security researcher who discovered the bug was able to get a payout from Coinbase's bug bounty program, since their own Dogecoin nodes are considered within scope. They initially classified this as critical, but downgraded it, so he only ended up with a measly $200. But throughout all of this, Dogecoin remained unfazed. So don't worry guys, your meme coins are safe. Well, for now. Next up, the latest installment of Operation Power Off, the ongoing campaign by international law enforcement to disrupt DDoS for hire services. Booters, stressors, flooders, whatever you want to call them. Noob-friendly services that allow you to rent packets power to boot offline a server for whatever nefarious reason. These kinds of websites are often targeted at DDoS enthusiasts on a limited budget. One of the booted booters, ZD Stressor, had subscription plans starting from just $15 per month, buying you the ability to run attacks for just five minutes at a time. In total, law enforcement took out 27 of these services, including Stark Stressor and Orbital Stress. Europol says three alleged administrators of these sites were arrested in France and Germany, and the actual users of these services aren't getting off either, because whilst many of these websites claim not to keep logs, this often turns out not to be quite the case. Europol says they discovered the IRL identities of 300 users, of which Dutch police have already arrested four of the worst offenders, including one guy who carried out more than 4,000 attacks. And the more hobbyist users are going to be sent physical letters or emails letting them know that they're on the radar of the police. Probably something like this, which was sent by Dutch police to users of raid forums after it was seized last year. The UK's National Crime Agency has said they're launching a Google Ads campaign targeted at people searching for these DDoS for hire tools. And I'm actually really looking forward to this because the UK has been known to run creative and slightly cringy adverts warning parents that kids who spend too much time in their bedroom might actually be turning into cyber criminals. Check this out. Ollie's such a clever boy. Such a clever boy. <laughs> Custard cream. Spends all night on, on his, his computer. computer. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, how smart is this? You know them shooter games? The other day he was losing, so he crashed the server. Proper whiz kid. It's amazing what kids can do these days. Night, Ollie. Or what do they call it? D-dossing. That's it, I saw it on the telly. You know, he's very clever with his money too. He's got Chocolate finger. And we only give him a tenner a week. Told us he robbed a bank. Anyway, that's probably enough of us rambling on. No, not at all. In fact, best if we start again from the beginning. Next up, if you have any information on this guy, you could be in for a $10 million reward. The US has unsealed charges against a Chinese individual for allegedly helping the Chinese government break into thousands of Sophos firewalls. These things are an enterprise level solution used by companies and governments around the world to protect their networks. But a series of espionage operations meant they had the exact opposite effect. 81,000 devices were hacked into, including those used in US critical infrastructure. 
Now, when I began researching for this topic, I didn't realize just how big of a rabbit hole I was getting myself into. Chinese attacks on Sophos files go back years, and it's not alleged that this guy is behind all the malicious activity, but rather he's just one pawn in a broad network of security researchers thought to be operating at the behest of the Chinese state. The activity that he's linked to are the Asnarok attacks in 2020. He's alleged to have worked for Sichuan Silence Information Technology, a company that allegedly sold its hacking services to multiple Chinese government agencies. According to court documents, they used an SQL injection vulnerability to gain remote code execution on vulnerable firewalls. Launching their attacks from domains impersonating Sophos, it's claimed that the exploit was designed to grab usernames and passwords from the firewall, which could be used to pivot into the networks of the victims and launch further espionage campaigns. But there's a lot of secrecy here. We don't know how successful the campaign was, or even which organizations in particular were targeted. Sophos published their own report on the campaign, and reading between the lines here, there is some evidence to suggest that some of the hackers involved might have gone rogue in an attempt to either undermine the operation, or maybe even make some quick cash for themselves. The very day before the Asnarok attacks, Sophos received a bug bounty report for a critical SQL injection vulnerability which affected the same line of firewalls. They note that this wasn't the same vulnerability as the one that was exploited and have low confidence of any direct connection to the attack. However, the timing is definitely suspicious, and the researcher's IP pings from the exact same city that the malicious Chinese company was based in. But this wasn't the only suspicious bug report. A couple years later, a report was made again for a critical vulnerability in their line of firewalls, again from a researcher based in China. This time, the vulnerability was being actively exploited, but again, with no direct evidence that this was the Chinese hackers double dipping, the researcher received a $20,000 payout. But as for our charged Chinese hacker, with these kinds of indictments, it's really just all purely academic, because of course he's based in China. So unless he goes on holiday to a country friendly with the United States, which if he has any sense, he, he won't, then he'll never see the inside of a courtroom. Next up, a short story on what it's like to be infected with spyware by Russian security services. Kirill Parabets is a Russian citizen who is living in Ukraine. Despite not being a Ukrainian citizen, he is ethnically Ukrainian and is clearly on their side when it comes to the whole war thing. However, after the invasion, Ukraine stopped renewing resident permits for Russians, so Kirill headed back to his home in Moscow. This is where things took a turn for the worst, because after returning home, he was raided by Russian security services who accused Kirill of sending money to Ukraine, which in fairness he did kind of admit to. Funding the enemy in times of war is generally considered counterproductive and typically frowned upon, so the FSB wasn't happy. They were so unhappy, in fact, that it's claimed Kirill was beaten so badly that he actually lost hearing in his right ear. He says the FSB gave him an ultimatum, become an undercover informant or spend 20 years in a penal colony. And in order to buy himself some time, Kirill agreed to their demands. The FSB then returned his phone that they had seized during the raid, a true monstrosity of a device, an Ucatel WP7. But he started receiving strange notifications, one that read Arm Cortex VS3 synchronization. It would seem the FSB hadn't done a great job of covering their tracks. They installed spyware on his device, but seemingly forgot to turn off debug mode. Kirill then discovered an app he hadn't downloaded, Cube Caller Recorder. It's a totally legit app that allows you to record phone calls, but the app on his phone wasn't the original app. It was a Trojanized version that came with some extra hidden features. If you compare the permissions of the Trojanized version to the legit app, it's obvious that something isn't right here. Presumably, the FSB had hoped he would have overlooked the permissions here, especially given a call recording app does by definition need much the same permissions as real spyware. At this point, Kirill decided to flee Russia, but given his every move was being tracked, he didn't have much choice but to leave his phone behind in Moscow. He did, though, manage to make a backup of the device and sent a copy to researchers at Citizen Lab, an organization that helps victims of state-sponsored hacking. They discovered quite a bit of overlap in the commands used to control the spyware on his phone and spyware known as Monocle. Monocle was originally discovered in 2019. It's spyware that was developed by Russian threat actors that is well known to impersonate a variety of legitimate apps. But unlike previous versions of Monocle, the researchers found several references to iOS in the code, suggesting that just maybe there's a version of this spyware out there which targets iPhones. As for Kirill, he successfully managed to flee Russia and is now lying low. But that's it for this video. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.